This is Paul Donovan from UBS's Global Economics Department. Another day, another couple of bank nationalization plans. In Europe, Portis is being bailed out by the combined efforts of three governments. In the United Kingdom, Bradford and Bingley is to be nationalized and partly sold off to Santander. Remarkably, these measures proved necessary in spite of restrictions on short selling. Perhaps, just possibly, the short selling spivs are not to blame for everything that is going wrong with the global financial system. Meanwhile, over in the United States, we seem to have agreement on the $700 billion of small change to benefit the banking industry and, incidentally, allow capitalism to function effectively. A few additional gestures have been added on, but the House will have to vote on this in a frozen state. The Senate could prove more of an obstacle, though passage is expected, with hopes that the bill will be signed into law at the end of this week. The process may take a little longer. The fact that this process has already dragged on as long as it has will, in all probability, extend the duration of the U.S. economic slowdown. The past week will have done little to increase the willingness to extend credit, or indeed to improve the sentiment of business or consumers. It's also worth putting things into perspective. The UK's nationalisation of Bradford and Bingley's loan book will entail taking on assets valued at around 10% of the US bailout plan. The United States is effectively offering nine Bradford and Bingley deals with the $700 billion package. $700 billion does not guarantee calm for the financial markets. Wachovia has put itself up for emergency sale as of Friday last week. Newswires report City, Wells Fargo and the ubiquitous Santander as being possible suitors. Meanwhile, last week, the Central Bank of the United Arab Emirates established a $13.6 billion emergency facility in its money markets, with the Gulf Daily News reporting a scramble for short-term cash. What next? What next is two years of significantly below-trend growth in the U.S. and globally, if we're lucky. The best-case scenario involves a prolonged economic slowdown. The process of deleveraging will not be completed quickly, and both lenders and borrowers will have to delever. Deleverage is, by its nature, disinflationary. We would expect OECD inflation rates to slow markedly. There is no evidence of monetization at the moment and no suggestion of quantitative easing of monetary policy. There's nothing in hand to stop the disinflation forces continuing. For the dollar, the point is, as it has always been, what is the willingness of the international investment community to purchase U.S. assets? The U.S. current account deficit may increase slightly as a result of the bailout plan and require some further support. However, if international investors are willing to pay current prices for U.S. assets, then there is no reason for the dollar to decline. If risk aversion increases home country bias, however, the dollar becomes vulnerable. European politics has been attracting some attention with the weekend's election results showing disquiet with the established order of things. In Austria, the far-right parties made headway in the parliamentary elections. Meanwhile, in Bavaria, Chancellor Merkel's coalition partners saw their weakest performance since 1954 and their first loss of an absolute majority in that state for half a century. Today's data is, of course, not going to reflect the full consequences of the recent turmoil. However, It will show markets how weak things were going into this crisis. Euro area consumer and industrial confidence for September is scheduled. We and the market inevitably look for a deterioration in both. Spanish inflation is seen at 4.8% on the year, moderating just slightly. And from the States, we have personal income and spending numbers. That's all for today. Have a good day.